if I may welcome uh, Prof. Sasedu. Prof, uh, uh, you may kick us off. I, I would like to invite you to introduce yourself, uh, maybe share a bit about the work that you do and the, yeah, the challenges and questions that you have uh, for Paul Slavic. Um, at the same time, could I ask everybody else who's not speaking, if you don't mind, to just mute yourself. Um, and then if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, Prof. Sasedu, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Janet, and welcome to Professor Slovic and all of uh, all are here. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Sajidul Haq uh, from Bangladesh. I am working here in uh, Bangladesh in a is a in a public university that's located uh, very coastal of the country. You know, if you see the map, a uh, very small country, uh, but uh, we have a, a coastal area. And uh, I'm from the background, my bachelor's, uh, my academic background, mainly from the fisheries. And my PhD is comes uh, from my neighboring country uh, in Thailand. Uh, it was on the food science and technology uh, where I work with the uh, seafood mainly. And uh, after that, I, I continue my job uh, here uh, and uh, started teaching and research. This, you know, professor, that is our main job. Uh, so uh, I teach to the students of uh, 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 courses related to the uh, like fish processing, quality control, microbiology, um, or fishing, uh, the methodology, all these things. Like my st uh, my work is on the from the fishing, catch the fish, and to the post harvest, uh, like processing, quality control, and export, uh, all this. Uh, this is the my area. Uh, uh, it's not like fully aquaculture or biology genetics. Not like, but my specialized in the area of uh, quality control uh, processing and this. And my research, uh, uh, my recent research, um, I, I mean, when I join in this job, and after that, my research, uh, simply in the two uh, uh, branches. One, it was uh, my related to my PhD, that is uh, food science and the uh, mainly food contaminant, uh, different types of contaminant, how it is a risk to the consumer, uh, like microbial contaminant uh, or chemical contaminant uh, or physical contaminant. So mainly different kinds of fresh fish or maybe processed fish like dried or frozen. Uh, so this kind of fish, uh, uh, what are the uh, contain the contamination and how it is going to the risk to the uh, consumer. Uh, this one and uh, recently that's the one part and the another one is like the community engagement coastal fishers how they are the livelihood and what are the other factors like climate change and how is their occupationally their food security uh, and their capacity building like they're working is not the proper way they are working uh, they are doing uh, the different kinds of free processing and and also the recent another work is on the marine pollution like plastics uh, uh, or this how is uh, negative impact to the biodiversity of marine biodiversity. Uh, so uh, this is how I, we try to, uh, I mostly uh, work with the fishermen. Uh, number one, that how can they catch fish in the, in the sea with the, uh, they have, uh, their occupationally they are safe. And so we had uh, several, uh, uh, so what are the main risk factors? Uh, that's which I try to identify that food insecurity, uh, the main problem for them. Uh, and the climate change that makes them the different um, area. So that's one thing. And then other than that, we try to give them some training for making the alternative livelihood that they can generate their income. And uh, another one is, uh, conserving the marine biodiversity and uh, saving the marine pollution other than. So these are work uh, um, uh, is going on here. Sounds like a, a, a lot of things that you're involved in. A lot of in. things, whole, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything, the whole world of, 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 uh, of, of fish in uh, all yes, it aspects. It's a about, big, it's a yes, big uh, scope. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> yes. Very important, uh, the, you know, what happens in the oceans and the marine life and the role of, of fish in our, uh, you know, in our cultures exactly. and our, you know, well-being. Yeah. yeah. And it's probably 
Do you feel it's threatened? Uh, you must feel that there's, uh, with the things you mentioned, the different types of contamination and other problems of climate change. So a yes. uh, big challenge, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. But uh, the, the the to the point, uh, question to you, but what I expect from you that uh, I didn't think uh, in the way you are thinking or you are working. Uh, so our thinking or, or direction is my idea that it was different, like uh, in the lab based, not uh, not too much on the social or psychological uh, aspect of the community, that how they are thinking, how they are coping with the like cyclone is coming, uh, the approaching, but even though they are a must to go for fish uh, in the sea because it's there for their livelihood. Uh, if they not go for fish in the sea, uh, maybe they will have no food for the family. Uh, so these are, and whenever they are in the deep sea and they know the signal, uh, weather signal, uh, but even though they are continuing fishing because mm -hmm. they said, uh, if we not continue fishing, uh, maybe we will not have uh, we will not have the food. So these are the uh, the risks and and other some other factor like fish availability. Their income is also changing. Uh, so we think that these are the effect of climate change, but we don't know. We didn't have any study specific study. So that I want to learn that how can uh, maybe you can suggest me we can uh, design our research or in aspect of the rex factors and and uh, uh yeah all these things please you can suggest me in general yeah and then we may talk right. specific so it's clearly a difficult decision for them if they if they're uh if they're told or they see that a storm is coming and they but they they need to fish for their income and so forth so so are they left on their own to do that? Do they have, is there anyone kind of overseeing this who gives them warnings and said, or, or who regulates this and said, well, you know, when this happens, we, you know, you can't go out or something like that. Or is it up, up to each person individually? No, uh, there's a regulatory body. Yeah, because, you know, they have not much sufficient manpower. So th yeah. there is like yeah, television or radio they are giving the government or regulatory authority, giving the uh, direction that you should not go. Uh, but uh, like uh, we have another issue, like uh, for the conservation aspect for the marine fishes, government has some uh, ban period that due to the, you cannot catch the fish during that time. So that's the government rules, like from October 1st to October last, this kind of day. Uh, but they're, and government giving some subsidy because this time you will have no income from the sea. So what you will eat, uh, you will family support the family support. They give some, they said it's not sufficient or maybe all the fishermen, they are not getting the same or they are not getting the support. So that's why it's a like of illegal fishing or illegal, uh, their income procedure violating mm -hmm. the rules. So yes, uh, they have the, some regulatory bodies, but still it is going and and are there a lot of uh, of uh, deaths of fishermen because they they go out and they get caught by the storm is this i mean is this a major uh, you know problem actually in terms of the actual number of uh, amount of harm that comes to the fishermen uh yeah yes uh, uh, it is large number uh, but uh, we last three years we are trying to quantify the fatalities but fatality is uh, less uh, but there is the fatality uh, but the risk is like uh, when one fisherman died his family is maybe he was the only one earning member in the family so mm -hmm. he's not only the one person but full family is uh, the like destroying uh, mm -hmm. so the uh, it is the issue is serious, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't ag exactly <laughs> know how to uh, advise you on that because it seems that I mean there has to be uh, oversight and 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 guidance for these people, and as you say, support for them 
uh, yes. if they don't go out. And if there's times of the years they can't fish, then what what do they do? How do they survive? So right. that's a, it's all part of a of a of a system that has to be coordinated and 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 all the different pieces put together uh, so that uh, they're not they don't feel compelled to take these risks. Clearly, they they uh, do do you, do they um, do you think they recognize the risk that but they're doing it but they do it because they have to or they you think that they feel confident due to their experience that exactly it you, you, you to them. Your point is right. Yeah, they're really, uh, you know, confident. Even though they say they're rigs, uh, very few of them are uh, like uh, they are not going. But many of them, they think maybe oh, uh, is a signal of five or seven. Like in our weather signal, if it is more than five, it is too serious. But they say oh, no problem. Last time I was in six signal or seven <laughs> signal, and there is there was nothing here. Maybe in other side of the country. It was problem, so that's why they are maybe uh, not try to understand the risks. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. that is the, is the right point you mentioned. Right, in a sense, what you're talking about is a false alarm. So you have this this signal and nothing happens, and then you 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 feel that uh, you you know it it doesn't mean the as serious as it's supposed to mean because yes. by their experience, and I think this is what we, we recognize as the sense of risk that comes from our experience as opposed to from the kind of the uh, uh, a more scientific uh, information that, that, that the experience is very powerful but but uh, I wonder if uh, there are, are are people in their community who they will listen to who you know maybe who have been you know Fisher you know people, and and who are respected and who can who recognize the problem the way you recognize it and then and then uh, uh, try to to meet with them and talk to them uh, you know and, and communicate what uh, you know what you think is important and I think one of the things that that people like myself have learned is that when those of us who are far away and 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 doing things in a different culture and with all kinds of science and statistics and things what we when we send our messages if we try to ad advise you based on on our sense of science in a distance it, it, that doesn't work it has to come i think it's from from the from the local uh community uh that that the risk management of what you're talking about um need, needs to be uh, centered around uh, local people who uh uh, understand things uh, in in the way that you're understanding them, and and communi can communicate then to this uh, this community of people in the who, who make their living uh, fishing and so forth. And that I think that's the. I mean that's uh, maybe it's maybe it seems obvious to you, but uh, but the uh, even though there's a lot of you know science about uh, you know wet weather forecasting and and what happens in storms and all this sort of thing. It, that that's really it that doesn't people they don't relate to that the way they would relate to local people who know the experience that they feel that they're experiencing but but can also can can influence them do you have people like that 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 could could uh, yes, take yeah, a leadership we, we role have, we have the uh, uh, the, the the peoples uh, like they're the government authorities like uh, Mean the government officials in the local uh, office, uh, they do all these things, uh, uh, but uh, they cannot monitor actually uh, effectively. They cannot control uh, the, because their populations and their manpower and these the people. Uh, uh, they because they are not aware enough that uh, because if they self motivated, so we, uh, yes, we should not do this or uh, we should understand the risks. Uh, because literally they are mostly are not too much educated uh, the coastal community the fisher community mm. so that is i think another one that another problem or limitation uh, they do not receive very well uh, the information that the, the severity or level of the risks yeah
Yeah, that's that's what I what I mean here is that uh, even at the local level, you have the people who are more the technical people, and they're not they they don't they're not they haven't been um, fishermen themselves. Uh, they're 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 government officials. And there's also yes. issues about in every culture of how, how you relate to your government. Yeah, I, yeah, same that differs, way. But but I'm talking about people who are from their their world, their community, who who uh, who have been in their in their uh, position and and you know have lived their experience here and and I really understand you know the uh, the conflicts that they that they're facing here uh, and and trying then to to uh, have those people uh, uh, communicate uh, and and then but 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 it's not just communication then it's it's also Okay, what what do you do? Supposing they do understand that these, you know, the risk, they yes. feel they feel forced. They have to they have to make a living for for their families. They have to, you know. Yes. Uh, so then, what you what you mentioned is very important that they have to have uh, support that enables them when it's dangerous, not to feel forced to go out yes. into the into the dangerous waters. They they have to be. A, a, a a a backup support that uh, so because what so I, but I but but I guess you are also saying that they feel confident so maybe they don't feel the tension you know <laughs> I mean you can communicate to them maybe if you communicated effectively then they would be more conflicted they wouldn't be so confident they, yeah yeah <laughs> but but then what would they do I mean if they don't have anything they, if they can't Okay, they would yeah. say, okay, now I'm I'm worried about going out and I'm risking my life and I'm gonna, you know, if I if I'm harmed, it harms my family or whatever. But I still have to do it. They just don't feel yeah. as good about it anymore. <laughs> and but so so it's uh, uh, it's a problem there too. They have there has to be the the uh, the backup system uh, okay. that uh, to 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 help them. Otherwise, you know. Um, maybe what they're doing is in that system. Maybe it's the best that could be done because they're working off of experience. They, you know, they they have a sense of the risk from doing it. You know, yeah. which is a very powerful. You have to respect the fact that 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 uh, their experience is a is a, a teacher. You know, it's and it, and it teaches them maybe that that they're that they can judge the weather through their 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 senses and experience you know they're their own risk they're doing their own risk assessment yes uh, there so now if you're going to inter intervene in that system you know are you going to make it uh, better for them or, or or worse for them and that that's a very complicated uh, question and, and 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 so i guess you have to i would say the first thing is to to talk with them, we maybe oh, you've probably yeah. done this is to really try to get to know them and uh, and their sense of how they deal with risk on a on a, on a yes. at, at a personal level based on their experience, as yes. opposed to bringing in the, the scientific perspective from a distance. Yeah. Okay. But do you, but maybe do you do maybe you do that? Uh, yes. You probably okay have, have done that. But there are other factors that you mentioned, like uh, contamination. I mean, yes. when you're talking here about the the risk from storms and fishing in the storms, but then there's also the sense of, you know, is the seafood uh, safe to 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 eat? You know, and how do we uh, how do we uh, know that and 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 make decisions there? And that's a that's a complicated question that uh, even in very um, uh, Science, westernized societies that have a lot of science, of, say the science of toxicology, uh, that studies how the effects of, of, uh, of say chemicals uh, on 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 human human health. Um, that's a complicated science, and yeah. and uh, how, and and there is research uh, in in the West uh, with colleagues. Uh, my colleagues and I, we have studied something we call intuitive toxicology which That's is how do people uh make judgments about the uh, the safety or risk of of uh exposure to chemicals for example 
And then how does that compare the way to the way a scientist makes those judgments? A science uh, a toxicologist makes those judgments. And yeah. uh, but uh, but our perspective was maybe a little bit different. We um, we were what we, what we were seeing in the West is a uh, oversensitivity to small to small what? amounts of chemicals in, in yeah. food or water or air where people um, demand very uh, high levels of of uh, protection. You know, they want all these contaminants removed at a very high costs when the scientists would say, well, it's really not dangerous at a small level. So yeah. uh, people were in, in some sense overreacting to yeah. to small amounts, uh, but uh, but sometimes the amounts are not small and you have to get them then to properly be cautious there too. So I mean, how how do you, how does that relate to what you experience and what you what you what you see and are concerned with? Uh, here, I know for for some uh, uh product because uh, like in general like processed fish, especially for example, I have some research on dried fish because it is a low cost uh technology processing technique. So this is like. People know that high number of chemicals is there, but still people are eating, and and there are uh, so here is I I think uh, and and some people are uh, they're not eating this one because they know there is a chemical contaminant, even though there is a fresh fish or no contaminant, but it's a perception that mm -hmm. this fish mean these are chemical contaminant. So, uh, so th th that is the problem. I feel that because somebody or some producer, they are good. They are maybe not making uh, chemical contamination is there, but mm -hmm. due to some other people, mostly is case that uh, some people are they are not uh, taking the dried fish. So it's, it's I think mm -hmm. mix uh, like sometimes uh, oast or sometimes yeah. overreacting. Yeah. Right. So the language is very important. The word contaminant is yeah. a problematic <laughs> word because because the scientist would say that even a, a tiny amount of some chemical uh, in 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 food is a contaminant. People contaminant. believe contaminant is high and serious, uh, and that yes, and the uh, the the science scientist, the toxicologist, recognizes. That that they, that what is critical is what they call a dose response relationship. That that some things can be dangerous in in high doses and not harmful in low doses. And so and they see that in their studies and and this is part of the science is is the importance of the level the dose. But what we found in our studies of of people's intuitive uh, toxicology reactions is they don't have a dose response relationship at least in in, in the in the western societies if if um, if a substance is found to be dangerous at high doses people believe it is dangerous at low doses as well and that it contaminates the food so they they um, uh, and that's a problem in the west and maybe that's not a problem for you that the the scientists study this by giving uh, with animal studies you know, say rats or mice, or, and they give them very yeah. high doses, you know, uh, for the lifetime of the animal to make sure that if something's bad, they won't miss it. So they, 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 they expose them at levels much higher than what people are exposed to. And then they say, oh, this chemical has caused, caused cancer in, in rats. Well, maybe it has, but it's, you know, at doses vastly higher than a human. But if humans see that, they don't want it at any any dose they don't want it in their food because it is a it's it's a carcinogen well it's a carcinogen at high doses but not yes. low. so i mean you get into those sorts of things where the science itself scares people and the word contaminant scares people uh because uh yeah. you know, people feel that if they if they if they uh, uh ingest something even at a small dose that has a tiny bit of of a substance in it they feel that, that they are contaminated by that substance and that's bad and especially if it's related to cancer you, can, you know that yeah. you they feel it's a 
it's something that at some point in time will then come and create cancer. So even though it might be very, very small, that, that's but that's the, the issue of overreaction. Uh, and, but the underreaction is a is a problem, and I think only uh, uh, regulation, you know, okay. has to come in because uh, again, yes. people will consume unsafe uh, uh, food, and if they don't get sick right away, they they feel it's okay. You know, okay, right. they need the food. So, and, you know, uh, they don't, they, again, they, their experience, this is all about experience. Experience is, is deceived because they eat the food and it seems fine. Even though the scientists would say, well, that the level of exposure is over time very dangerous to them, but they don't yeah. see the over time problem. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. I, I'm sorry to have to jump in here. Um, Professor Selu, I, I hope um, you, you managed to, to, to gain some insights into some of the questions that you have. Um, I'd like yes. actually to, to pass on the time to Prof. Ucharya, um to maybe uh, speak about uh, her work and, and, and share some of her, her challenges as well. Uh, Prof. Ucharya, um, please. Uh, okay. Thanks, uh, Professor uh, Professor Klovic. How do I pronounce it? Yes, correct. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I, for that insight, I also benefited from that. And um, thanks, uh, Professor. How do I put Jok Joker uh, for sharing your work to us? Yeah, I'm sorry for uh, mispronouncing your name. Um, you carry on, which is my name. Um. The 2022 winner of Sensible Science and Nature, John Meadows Prize. Yeah, so uh, my work um, hovers around contamination again. That's why I was quite interested mm -hmm. in right. <laughs> the insights from Professor Slovic. Um, yes, I do monitoring of contaminants. I do um, intervention in terms of remediation of contaminated environment. And I'm more in, interested in the organic contaminants. I do in organics, but I have higher reputation in organic contaminants because of the uh, relatability in my environment. I live and work in the Niger Delta of Nigeria, where we are known for all exploration activities. So. Um, organic contaminants uh, constitute the bigger wall to the society. Uh, mm -hmm. We have associated contaminants in the inorganic forms, but we are often inundated with organic contaminants in hydrocarbons and uh, other chelating compounds, are the compound that can uh, combine with hydrocarbons to to pose nuisance to the environment, either by way of not being broken down uh, within a reasonable time or uh, being able to convert to more toxic forms in some situations that are enabling. Yeah, so I do biological technology called bioremediation. That's my technology for which I have a patent in. Um, so I work with communities to recover contaminated environment, mostly soil and wetlands. Yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, the big water bodies, uh, the government will do intervention either by using our uh, detergents to break up the surface layers of the, the oil. The wetlands are often abandoned maybe because their their importance are not being felt seemingly by by government because they are uh, they are smaller in size but for us scientists they hold a very big future for all of us as you talked about biodiversity because the wetlands as they are seasonal they are very important to organisms amphibians hatching, doing all kinds of things. So I'm really very interested in wetlands and in the soil because of uh, 
people, uh, uh, we now want to have zero poverty. We want to have uh, everybody to produce food or to have food available to them. So we need more of agricultural lands to be able to grow the food. So my interventions try to meet this need in line with the SDGs. Um, so um, oftentimes I've done this for many years, uh, for over 20 years. So um, my communication problems uh, keep changing because it's dynamic. Uh, so the risk assessment we do at the beginning of projects uh, was useful or is useful. But like I said, the dynamics, um, sometimes insecurity will set in and you can't go there. So it becomes impossible to do like a, a prior risk assessment before going to your project. So it's just when you get the wind that is safe or relatively safe to go back to your field, you just go to be quick about it. So you jump some steps to get in there. So it becomes more uh, tricky. Um, again, in our communication effort, um, we try to tell out our communication efforts according to the audience we have, being the local community, being the government, because I try to take my evidence to government to see that that influences policies. I also try to engage with the polluters, the companies, oil companies that are making the pollution to see that they can uh, bring funding to support research, to assist them to have more sustainable ways of managing the environment on which they act. Uh, so we are met with a lot of um, obstacles um, like the oil industries, uh, they don't want to patronize technologies like mine. One, because they will say it is relatively new, um, maybe not listed among the technologies approved by government. Uh, we need to do a lot of demonstration to show evidence. I have done demonstration, but they also will tell you the communities, um, are not very patient. The community members are not patient when the when the pollution happens. They want to wake up in the morning and everything is clear. So biological technologies are not their bride in any way in this marriage because they want something that is magical, like chemical, like physical, excavate and dump elsewhere, shifting the goalposts of the problem. So, because they want the communities to allow them to continue to explore, to tap into the natural resources and continue to be richer. But who suffers here? This is um, a big problem for us. So you go to government and the procedures are long, bureaucracy, oh, we allocate a land to you, you come demonstrate, we come to do um, monitoring, we come back to, then there's a change in government and the people don't arrive to look at what you're doing. And then the project goes through another cycle with the new government. So this changing audience um, that is very difficult to characterize when you have understood your audience to some extent, and then the audience changes, even in the community leadership. When now the community leadership is influenced by politics. So um, new, government like regional government, the governor of a state. So maybe they have their loyalists in those communities and they influence community leadership. So it changes and you start working hard all over to understand these new people. So these are associated uh, challenges I have in communicating the risk. Do the communities, uh, are they actually uh, benefiting from the the increased wealth that is produced, or is it really going to the companies and uh, the communities being uh, exploited in that way? Uh, do do they do they uh, do they appreciate the fact that these um, industries are there uh, helping them, or do they just uh, get a little bit of help and and face risk not only to their health but also to their to their culture? 
Uh, I mean, what's the sense there of the community, or or is there uh, are the, is the community divided as to whether what is being done is helpful to them or harmful? What's what's the sense of that? Yeah, the the community is heavily divided uh, because uh, the oppressors, the companies, I call them oppressors. So they have divide and rule approach to dealing with the communities. So they get a chunk of the leaders installed, and then the leaders become super rich, and then can force down the truth of the populace, this has to happen. So it doesn't go around that mass poverty in the area, but few are very, very rich and comfortable. Yeah, and then you have the very educated who are not rich, so they use their knowledge. So if I have research results and you come to share your results with the communities, some of these educated ones who are not rich, they want to have access to your data so they can head to the courts. Mm -hmm. So when they get access to the data, which I try as much as possible not to give to them, if they have access to the data, they head into court. And then the court also now is being influenced in the space, in the political space. So judgment is delayed and environment is a sufferer, which we don't want as environmentalists. So it's tricky. So, are you saying that that if you if you uh, take the legal approach and go to the courts, uh, it actually doesn't help. It, it it makes things worse. So because by delay and so forth, or because because I would have thought that the the courts are the remedy here. Uh, that uh, if you have uh, environmental uh, law uh, experts who can Come in and, and make a if again if if the system is you know is designed to work properly that that uh, the that the courts are the are the remedy in in the United States that has I think been more of the case that uh, there, there is a lot of litigation and it has forced the companies because the companies aren't going to listen to anything as you say I mean they're the oppressors they they you know and they have many ways they have they have a uh, you know they have control, they have power, uh, and and they're making the money. Uh, you know how do you force them to uh, to to uh, do things that are uh, more in line with the proper treatment of the people? If you don't if you don't have the courts, um, the the government the government um, won the tax paid by the company because they pay big tax mm -hmm. and government can have money to do their business. Um, so they are not hard on the company. And then they have mm -hmm. a lot of money to influence things in the court. You can have a lot of adjournments. So it, may, it must not be that justice is not given. But when you go to the court this month and you're given the next date in two months or in four months to come back adjourned, adjourned and you keep paying the lawyers. So, and people keep getting mad because nothing is working. You have a date in the future. So a lot of chaos. So it doesn't help. So, so, so what do you do then instead that to, to try to go around this uh, system and, and do things that, that, that help the community uh, when you, when you don't have the help from the government or the, or the, or the companies, what, what is your, what is your method? Or are yeah, you I, what it works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. I work with the community to um I share my results with them so they can see uh the implication of leaving the environment while the court case is on. So I try to open up the spectrum so they can see what is going on with their children, with their crops, with their animals animals and all of that. So sometimes I get them to cooperate with me to clean the environment because when they go to court, they don't want you to intervene because the court may come for sight, for sighting. So if you start intervention, the court comes and there is no evidence. 
So they want you to leave everything as is, they barricade that and protect their pollution. So for a long time, number of months or even a year or more. So sometimes I convince them to environment and ignoring the courts and their processes. So, uh, so some of the times you're, you're saying that you're the cultural yeah that they have to do it themselves basically and they have to kind of protect themselves and know where not to go or what to avoid and try to clean up this I mean this is this is a very difficult situation I would think that they're in if there's serious uh pollution uh and it's maybe it's a it's a short-term survival mode it's better than than nothing but but meanwhile the companies are doing their you know polluting and, and the government is benefiting it's just so in 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 my community uh based out of the related to the university of oregon there's an uh, there's a an organization that of of uh, of lawyers environmental lawyers uh and their the name is e law just the letter e law and they they work with people oh. e law if you look them up they work with people uh, with uh with uh, people like yourself from all over the world they they bring them to eugene uh, my city for education about how to how to uh, use the law effectively uh, when they when they go back to their their uh, their communities uh, and uh, and and again this is this is the this is the again the legal framework where you have to you have to uh, you have to fight back uh, with uh, with legal means and of course that may not work in some in in some countries that <laughs> where the law just can't you know it, it again it's it's politics and uh, and it's it's very uh, it's very challenging. The other uh, another uh, direction I, I know that you, uh, my colleague Robin Gregory, who gave a lecture, uh, uh, and is available to consult with, I believe, uh, uh, he and his his colleagues have done something uh, very very important in in uh, in this uh, fight against uh, against the big corporations. And they, they have they have demonstrated the importance of social and cultural values uh, in in uh, these uh, environmental uh, conflicts that that ordinarily don't carry any weight. And I mean the the power uh, is done is is commu is the, with the economics with the money, you know. And and the fact that you're you're uh, you're harming people's quality of life. Their way of life, their cultures, uh, doesn't get any weight. Well, what Robin and his colleagues have done very, very recently, and and you could uh, best talk with him about it. But I can even send you the papers that he's just written, very important papers showing that you can you can measure, you can define what these social and and, and cultural values are, so they can stand up. Uh, next to economic values, and show that these are important too, and 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 should not be ignored. Now, again, you have to assume that your system is honest and is and cares about people. But if it does, then what what Robin and his colleagues have shown is you have to respect what you're doing to the quality of people's lives and cultures. And this is now uh, uh, out there in the science. They, their most recent paper, just a, a month or two ago. Was in the most one of the most important journals in the world called Science. Uh, there's you know, Science, and then there's Nature. Those are the two important, most important uh, 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 journals uh, in, in the world. And and they have an article in Science showing that that you can assess the economic impact uh, of harm to the social and cultural well-being of people. And so that then you can you you can play the game with the with the corporations who are all focused on on economics, and 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 uh, you you can show that uh, the, uh, that they're the harm that they are causing to local communities, but uh, in a, in a way that is more powerful. So I can I can 
uh, uh, certainly send those. I can send those to Jared and he can circulate them because he has your email addresses. I, I What I'll do in, is send the two papers uh, that are quite recent by, by Robin Gregory and his colleagues. And of course, Robin is part of this project. So, uh, uh, and and he, he has made a, a, a video where he certainly talks about this a little bit, but he's available as well. And um, uh, I mean, I think that's something that's that's needed because otherwise you're playing a game uh, that you can't win against the companies because they have the economic uh, power, uh, as you say, and, and the governments, you know, uh, want, want their money as well. It's all about money when in fact, you know, life is about more than money. But, but, but if you can't demonstrate, you know, the social and cultural harm that's being done by pollution, it loses out, you know. So, so, so that's why Robin's work is important. And then the work of people in ELA is important because they, they pay attention to things like what you know, Robin and others are doing, and try to use that in the courts. So all of this is is in a direction. I'm not saying that what you're not doing is important. You're you're working in the system because it's so difficult to to do it in the other way. But but uh, still, your people are having to kind of accept this pollution and and just work around it. You know, be careful. Don't go here. You know, don't, maybe it's an area that they that they want to go in that, that has important social and, and cultural significance in their community, but they can't go there anymore because it's because it's uh, it's contaminated. Well, okay, so sure, if they avoid it, they avoid the contamination, but they are losing something in their lives by doing that. I and mean, the companies are, you know, again, all this again, it depends on on whether you can you have a political world where you can actually get get some things done that's another another matter and i uh like i know that uh, even in the united states it's very difficult because there's more and more people who are on the side of the companies and not on the side of the people so anyway just some thoughts there but i can i will send the robin's uh work because it's very it's very new it's very uh unique it's the first time that i know of that uh, that uh, social scientists have been able to identify and quantify social and cultural values that are ordinarily neglected in these situations. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to, to follow up with any more resources that you want to pass along uh, to Prof. Vichara, to Prof. Sasidu, and to, and to Henry as well. Um, if I could, could I, thank you, Prof. Vichara, could I uh, pass on the time to Henry? Hi, Henry. Uh, thank you for your patience. Could I uh, invite you to maybe share a bit more about yourself, the work that you do, and some of the questions that you have for Prof. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to Hello. I would like first to offer uh, I would like to offer my apologies. Uh, I joined the meeting a little bit late. I got a little bit held up uh, in my evening class, but I managed to join. Okay, I want to thank, uh, take this opportunity to first thank the Sense About Africa in partnership with the Lloyd Register Foundation for organizing this uh, expert consultation uh, with Professor Slovic. Okay, <clears throat> I am Henry Ronald. I'm a 20 year old Kenyan. Uh, I reside in Kisumu, Kenya. Uh, I study, uh, I'm currently studying a bachelor's degree in civil and structural engineering in the Masinde Moliro University of Science and Technology. Unlike my two other participants, uh, I don't have vast experiences in the risk aspect, but I aspire to do more. With me, uh, I will address two, two, two aspects of risk. That is the environmental pollution and the risk involved in the workshop or workplace safety. Okay, uh, I first, back in the year 2020, uh, on the outbreak of Corona, uh, we were a little bit uh, free from school and uh, together a CBO organization in the Kisumu sector, SEMI, uh, mobilized a section of the youth, me included, and we were taken through various capacity building projects. Uh, on the specific project that we were undertaking was one abbreviated at KUSH, which uh, was a project 
waste management. And from these, we learned that uh, even the youth can take, uh, can give their part uh, in promoting risk literacy uh, throughout the community. So the risk involved in such uh, the project were risk involved with poor waste management. Uh, poor waste management may result in various risks, various risks such as uh, environmental pollution, uh, which is more prominent in the informal settlements. You find that uh, uh, the people within the community have diversity in perception of risks. You find one person may perceive a certain risk different from the other, uh, which hinders uh, the which hinders youth practitioners such as I. Uh, another risk that uh, another challenge that uh, I've passed through uh, during our project, during our programs within the community, is that the community have been misinformed, misinformed, they have misinformation on risk. So uh, I would advocate for, so my role as a youth risk champion, Ruth, my role as a youth risk practitioner would be to source uh, relevant information from organizations such as Risk Know How, such as from experts such as Professor Slovic, uh, package them well into simpler languages that the common person within the community whose literacy levels are not such high in our region so that they may understand uh, the relevant risk information free from the jargon uh, used by the scientists and package them into a basic and basic understandable language to them and <clears throat> give it to them so that they may know about risk, understand about risk, so that after all this, they may be able to understand the risk and be able to identify certain risks within the surrounding by themselves and make uh, informed decisions uh, to counter, mitigate, and avert such risks. Yes, uh, that would be my contribution. Uh, I'm open to any questions. Uh, and to my questions, to I have some questions to the professor. Uh, my first question would be that: uh, What are some of the, what are some of the relevant, what are some, what are some of the, what are some of the uh, relevant and uh, update? What are some of the relevant and uh, current strategies that can be used by youth practice by risk practitioners such as I, specifically the youth, so that they may foster uh, risk, uh, they may foster risk awareness among the youth so that they may be growing, knowing more about the risk and uh, disseminating this, this such information to the upcoming generation. You find that certain risk in the world uh, today, such a, a major risk worldwide is that of global warming. You find that the, uh, the scientists uh, of recently, not just recently, find that maybe in the 2000s, uh, realized about the global warming, the rate at which it was uh, rapidly increasing, and it uh, triggered a uh, certain worry, so that the relevant institutions have come up, have were formed to come up with strategies to avoid to avert certain risk uh, risk involving global warming. So that uh, with this, I see that uh, when the youth, such as I, which are uh, the upcoming generation also to say so. Uh, if you are able to be given or uh, also to be trained uh, on the relevant risk on, on, our, on our society as we face today, we may be able to foster uh, a risk awareness, a risk awareness, uh, risk awareness mentality to our fellows who are coming so that the future world may be better and we may avoid certain risks in the future thank you good so are you are you working mostly in the rural communities in kenya or do you as opposed to nairobi or, or is it nairobi as well but do you, do you do a lot of work in the in the rural areas okay uh, I, uh, I reside in kisumu city that is a it is a city in kenya uh, it is in the located in the western nyanza region of kenya but i yeah. study in the in a nearby county, which is Kakamega. So within my home community in Kisumu, we live in a, one of the four one one of the four informal settlements uh, within the Kisumu. 
and we find that uh, there are various risk challenges uh, which arise from these informal settlements uh, due to various factors such as, such as uh, poverty uh, and low employment. Yeah. So in such my background in, within the neighborhood, uh, the more prominent risk is related to environmental pollution. So I have some I experience with Kenya. I've been to Kenya several times. Yes. Um, yes. I went first with a local, with friends, a group of friends to uh, to uh, to look at the uh, you know uh, like a safari to see animals, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which yeah, are they, remarkable. They and uh, and uh, our guide was a uh, uh, an older, sixty-three-year-old uh, white uh, Kenyan. He was born in Kenya, but he, he and he was a safari guide. But he was very concerned about the well-being of the people uh, in the rural villages. So, so uh, you know, not, we not only looked at animals, which is spectacular, but we went and and went to the villages and 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 got to know some of the people and to see what they were, what their problems were. And and recognize uh, you know that like one of the main problems uh, was uh, education that uh, many uh, many young people could not afford to go to school they couldn't afford the uniforms to, to buy and or or they were uh, out uh, out uh, hurting uh, shepherding animals uh, and didn't have you know weren't able to go to school so there was a major problem just with the basic education. Starting at the lower grades. So, is that is that an issue that you face in as well? And you, with regard to uh, dealing with risk, because these, many of the people ha have no education. Okay. Uh, so, on the issue of basic education, uh, it was a it was a challenge uh, some years back. But the government has put in place uh, certain me me certain uh, measures to counter. Such so that you find that today the basic education is free in Kenya, so that uh, even the, those who, are not, who may not be able to afford a certain uh, amount of schools, we can be able to study free of charge. And that uh, in the rural places, and even at the diverse places that face a certain uh, challenges, such as in the dry, uh, in the arid places, the government has put in place uh, strategies such as feeding programs to encourage students to encourage children and even the parents to send their children in school. So uh, basic education, uh, is, it used to be a major challenge, but today I, uh, I see it as uh, we have made progress uh, encountering such. I, I uh, didn't get the sense. So, so when my friends and I came back to Oregon, we created an, a, 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 an NGO uh, yes. to work W uh, and uh, try to address some of the the problems that we saw uh, working with people uh, leaders in in Kenya who who uh, and and we basically raised money to help them the local people figure out how to deal with their problems and their problems were things like uh, uh, not only education but also they didn't have uh, uh, water was scarce and and uh, difficult you know they had to go long distances to get water from a well or something. And, and, and they also uh, uh, didn't have adequate medical uh, uh, care. Maybe that's changed because we started this 20 years ago. But, uh, but these, were, these, are, these are issues that are fundamental to, uh, to, uh, um, to have risk and health, which are you know, more immediate than global warming. Uh, obviously, global warming is in the background, but uh, people have their, their immediate uh, immediate needs, and in terms of, of uh, I, first I think what you're doing is really important, and, and I hope that you can continue your education to uh, to to gain more knowledge about how to how to uh, to work with uh, people uh, and and communicate. Um, but one of the the best ways, sure, we we can in the West we can give these questionnaires to people, and and now we do questionnaires over the internet and this sort of thing. But but you can learn a lot just by getting a group of people together and talking with them you know and and uh, you know and, and asking them well what what are your concerns what are you concerned about and see what you learn from a from a local uh, level because it'll be different from each one community to the next and from one person to the next 
So that's a way to, to do a, 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 I think the, one of the things we learned about risk communication is it starts with perception. Uh, that is, you have to understand how people uh, perceive and think about risk in order then to, to know how to communicate with them about them. Uh, you have to know what their concerns are. So you address, your communication is focused on the things that are concerning with them. You have to also know, are there situations where they are, are misperceiving the risk, where, they, where there's something serious that they should be concerned about that they're not? So and then and then you focus your communication that way. So so co the communication uh, is is the necessary part of effective communication is to first to understand how people are thinking about risk and perceiving about it. And I think uh, that you can learn a lot. You don't have to use complicated surveys uh, to do this. You just go and 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 talk with people, and 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 you can you can learn then uh, about their sense of uh, how they're thinking about things that, that, that you think about from a, from a more uh, you know, uh, educated, advanced perspective, you know, engineering perspective or, or other, uh, you, know, you see, well, okay, that's your perspective. What's their, how are they thinking about it? Is there a way that then you can help them uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, think more um, um, you know, in, in ways that are more beneficial to them? after you learn how they are thinking about them, about them. So it starts with understanding where they're coming from and how they're thinking about it. And, uh, and, and obviously there's, a, there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done. I think throughout Ken Kenya, there's so many, there are many places and they're all facing different problems and, and, and global warming is going to, and is exacerbating that in terms of droughts and other sorts of, of, uh, of things. So, uh, you know that's relevant to the picture as well, and how are they coping with it, and what are they, you know, what are their plans for, you know, the future if will they have water? Uh, my uh, in one in one village we went to, the uh, the water supply was a well that was uh, it was five kilometers from the city from the village rather, and they and the women were were walking to the to the well with with uh, you know jugs to fill with water and then walking back these five kilometers with these heavy heavy uh, jugs and this is this is how they were dealing with getting a fresh water so my wife and i uh, uh bought a, a a cart with the two donkeys uh to that they could put the, the jugs on the uh, uh, they didn't have to carry them themselves and so they named the dog donkeys after me and my wife, Roz and Paul. We have the donkeys, but I mean these are the these are the problems that are, you know, that are faced and real to people and are are risk problems. And so obviously, when you go to communities and you you see for each any community what are their problems and how they're thinking about it, I think that's the start in really you know, and it starts with understanding and how do they understand and perceive things. How does that, you know, do you th how can you help them through communication and education? Does that make sense or am I? Uh, it makes sense. It, it does. So, or, or on such, uh, so you find that uh, even recently, uh, now uh, we are experiencing El Nino rains. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, some people, people are being killed, properties are being destroyed uh, by floods. Which are uh, come year in year out as a seasonal, uh, and during each season, people lose their lives, properties are, are destroyed. Find that these are associated risks uh, uh, related to such uh, heavy uh, rains. But the government uh, should should be in a position to put in place measures to avoid such risk. You find that uh, the Lino rains were predicted uh, sometime back with uh, uh, the meteorologist, but uh, the government were aware, but. Uh, there are not uh, adequate measures taken. I find that now we are experiencing floods in various uh, parts of the country. People are being killed. And the funny thing that is that even the arid places right now are experiencing floods. Uh, uh, their properties are being damaged, people are being killed. And soon after the linear rains, they're, they're facing the challenge of water. You find that the government has not put in place uh, strategies to harvest such water in large quantities to be used uh, on 
such on later dates uh, or on, on other season on on later dates when the uh, when the rains subside uh, you find that measures such as that will provide water for the community in the, in the arid places and future to come and will avoid uh, pe people losing their lives uh, property being disturbed properties being damaged uh, and such so you probably know the green belt movement uh, and and Wangari Maathai is that familiar to yeah. you? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Professor Wangari so, Maathai is a renowned uh, so, so I have a, a grandson who who's um, uh, I, I have a, a grandson whose uh, last name is Maathai after her. My yeah. my son uh, was uh, admirer of Wangari Maathai and and named his son a, after after her and. Um, and then my son was was killed in an accident, and um, we sent money to the Greenbelt movement uh, uh, because he was a uh, admirer of of, of the uh, movement Hungary, and uh, they planted a tree uh, uh, in in his memory that we visited. Uh -huh. And so my wife and I uh, visited there and met Wangari Mathai and visited his his tree there. But she. In the Greenbelt movement, I mean, they, she, um, with uh, millions of, of women, they they planted millions of trees. They 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 saw trees as as one way to try to deal with the uh, with with yes. the climate change. And they said, well, a tree does everything for you know. There's so many yes. uses for a, a tree, you know. Uh, and uh, this is a very valuable resource because it assumes you have to have water for the trees. But but I mean, that was their approach to. To improving the environment and the well-being of that, and of course, she won the Nobel Prize. She won the Nobel Prize for that a few years before she died for 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 the uh, the movement that uh, that uh, planted millions of trees uh, there. She so had, uh, she had the various achievements. Yeah. So I don't know if I did. You had other questions that you uh, uh, or other. Things you wanted to to uh, to ask. You asked about emerging. Well, how, yeah. you know, I, I see your questions. Cultural factors. How do they impact risk perception? Uh, and how yeah, are they yes, 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 yes. And and that's very important because culture matters a lot. And 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 you have to take that into account. And the only way to do it is by being in the culture and talking with people and and understanding the culture because it's so different from one place to another. And what you know the the risk perception the approaches to risk say in the in the uh, western united states with the, our own culture here i mean it doesn't you can't assume that it automatically uh, transfers to uh, you know to another another culture so and, and it's been understudied it's not as we don't know enough about that so you'll have to discover that you have to learn it yourself but but i think the point is that it does matter but the only way you can really deal with it is by you know understanding the culture and and uh, and seeing how how to tailor your communications to that to that culture so uh, I, I mean um, you asked about emerging uh, risks and uh, yeah, uh, emerging strategies to, uh, to avoid yeah and, and of course I think the as you know I mean the biggest emerging risk is the changing the climate which has it's not one thing it's many many different things it's it's extremes of climate it's not just warming it's it's extremes in, in drought and floods and all of this so uh that's and and we have uh, we have responded too slowly to deal with it so now we have to live with the consequences and hope that we can keep them from getting worse but certainly uh, a country like Kenya will be and is you know greatly affected by that and then that leads to to conflict when people no longer can uh, they uh, they lose their resources that they depend on in their in their local area sometimes they then move to other areas and and try to take over other areas that have more resources and that starts of course creates uh, conflict so that's going to be another uh, um, consequence of global warming is uh, is fighting over resources and water. We see that even in the United States, where water is getting scarce, and we have a river that's coming. And you know who who, who has access to the water in the river, and 
and things like that. So it's uh, uh, that's certainly going to be uh, 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 a problem. And in, in how can individuals uh, prepare for that? Well, uh, I think they have to work with others, with the community, with and hopefully with uh, with the government and and the politics to uh, to deal with it. I mean, it's uh, it's. It, and that's another thing that's uh, that we've learned. We, we, your 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 question: How can individuals deal with these big problems? And what we have learned in our studies, um, and I think I talked about this in my lecture number two when I talk about the what we call the arithmetic of compassion, is that one of the factors that 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 uh, stops people from doing important things is they feel powerless. You know, they feel, well, I'm just one person. You know, I can't stop climate change on my own. So, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, so I won't do anything. And that's and that's a problematic problem because sometimes they can do important things. You shouldn't get uh, demotivated uh, from what you can do because you can't do it all. And so, uh, and, and, and so we, we tried, we have tried to, to communicate, get people to first to understand that uh, that they shouldn't think this way, that that everything counts, um, and that uh, you can also amplify your own uh, effectiveness by joining forces with other people or with organizations that are dedicated to the problems that you're dealing with. Because as an organization, you have much more uh, power than than you as an individual. So you 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 give your your time and your effort and your support and that you take part in their activities and you and you lend p political support to organizations that are doing the right thing that's a very powerful thing and what and we, we gave a name to this uh, sense of 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 inefficacy we call it pseudo inefficacy so if you go you know look at my lecture or uh, we have a website called arithmeticofcompassion.org uh, and it talks about pseudo, pardon, arithmetic. Of Could you put in the organization? No, uh, it's a website. Please. Anyway, we, so we 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 uh, we try to educate people about uh, the fact that uh, they shouldn't feel helpless because they can't do it all. Uh, and in fact, even Wangari Mathai uh, had a story about about this. Uh, she. Uh, she she gave a talk, uh, and it uh, it was a story about uh, about a hummingbird. So, the hummingbird. The hummingbird theory. Yeah, you know that the story. Uh, uh, so, yeah, the, the, the forest is on fire, and all the animals run away and are just watching it burn down. And the hummingbird uh, goes out and fi finds a a pond and picks up some water and flies over the wa the, the fire and drops a beak full of water and all the animals make make fun of the, the hummingbird you say what what are you doing you're, you're so you know yeah you can't uh, you can't uh, st stop this fire and the hummingbird says well I'm doing the best I can <laughs> you know but uh, anyway um, the sense of efficacy is very important and people have to appreciate that uh, not to get discouraged because they can't solve a problem themselves and they have to work with with others uh, to do that and uh, uh, that again is another element of dealing with risk is to uh, to do what you can do because uh, we saw we saw that in our studies we st where people could could help a starving child uh, by sending money to an uh, uh, an aid organization um, and and then if if we if they were told that there are many such children starving in their region there, then they stopped they 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 didn't send the money because it didn't feel as good to help this child when they realized how many children they weren't they weren't helping so they didn't help the child they could help even though they could do it it didn't feel as good so they stopped well that's wrong you know. Uh, you have to appreciate that, and so we in our and this website we say even partial solutions can save whole lives. You know, 
you know, appreciate what you can do and don't get discouraged by what you can't do if you, you know, do what you can do. Yes. Oh, I'm wondering whether you can send me the website as part of the resources that I can pass along to Henry. Uh, certainly, okay, certainly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it seems to me that um, community involvement is it's, it's quite a common theme uh, relating to all three of the discussions that we have. And along with um, tailoring risk communications by knowing your audiences to risk perceptions, I think that's another thing that stood out for me. And I think this ties in very nicely to the work that we're trying to do at um, the Risk Know How Project. And I think that's also, or hopefully and uh, will be a valuable resource for risk practitioners such as the three of you, but also for other risk practitioners that you may know of in your community, in your workplace. And um, it's precisely these sessions like this that we, we hope to try and bring more engagement, more discussion um, between experts and practitioners. So um, like Paul alluded to earlier, we have other um, sessions available, two more sessions actually available uh, with Paul and with uh, Prof. Robin Gregory. So if anybody else uh, in your network comes to mind that would benefit from such a session, from such a session uh, please do uh, either reach out to myself or reach out to Alfie and we'd be happy to, to try and arrange for a, a session in the future. Um, like I said earlier, also, so, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with the three of you, Prof. Vicharya, Prof. Sasedu and Henry, uh, some resources that are uh, that Prof. Stovic talked about earlier. I'll also share a bit more about our institute and also with uh, Sense About Science and Risk Know-How. So um, there are different avenues that you can consider approaching for, for any future um, support that you may need. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Stovic today. Thank you, Paul, for, for taking the time to, to speak to, to everybody. Um, yeah, we, we, I think I really, really appreciate the insights that you gave. And um, yeah. Thank you everybody for joining us here today as well. well thank you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, for your interest. For it was a pleasure to meet you virtually. I mean, it's not the same as in person, but we have people all over the world here. It's a remarkable technology, and so it's nice to nice to to meet you. And uh, if you have questions for me, I'll send a few things out, and and um, you know, let me know if you have any specific uh, questions or if there there's any uh, articles. Uh, if you see that there's articles of mine that uh, that uh, look of interest, uh, I can easily provide those all. It's all uh, uh, digitized and I can send things if they're of interest. So good luck with you. You're all doing important and, and challenging work. You can see how challenging it is. And so don't get discouraged because you can't immediately solve it all. <laughs> Thank you.